After the critical success of his first film, Dark Star, John Carpenter was approached by a movie producer to create an exploitation film for less than 100 grand under the condition that Carpenter would have full creative control. It became known as Assault on Precinct 13. What's going on everybody and welcome back to the John Carpenter review series and now we are at the second film Assault on Precinct 13 and this is another first time watch for me. I actually saw the remake in theaters and loved that movie for a number of years before I ever even realized it was a remake, let alone a remake of a John Carpenter flick. This was the first film that Carpenter made with full studio backing from Jump Street and it started the long tradition of him writing, directing, scoring, as well as editing his films. He's always been one of those directors that more times than not completely controls the entire filmmaking process whenever he is bringing a story to life. And with his script that was originally titled The Anderson Alamo, essentially he was trying to blend the styles and the stories of Rio Bravo and Night of the Living Dead. And when you watch this film knowing that, he really did blend both of those styles of giving that old classic Western siege movie and also having just a nameless, faceless villain that is scary for its numbers more so than its personalities or its character traits. And starting off with the positives for Assault on Precinct 13, I just love that initial setup of having police officers as well as a few other people inside of this old derelict, broken down and almost completely cleared out police station while it is being sieged by the criminal element. Now, like I said, I've seen the remake a number of times. That was my first introduction to this story, which certainly takes a little bit of a different spin on this original story, but it's very similar. And this original story kicks off in a much grittier and more cynical way to where you have this gang that takes up LA and they have stolen all of these weapons. It's in the news. It is in the know of the public consciousness and this police force takes down a number of these gang members in the opening scene. And so the rest of the film, the gang is essentially trying to take out its frustration on the citizens and eventually the police officers of Los Angeles. The first act is very kind of slow and methodical with the way that it builds up to the eventual precinct siege. And so you see this ice cream truck driver and he keeps driving around town. He keeps seeing this car that has all of like the gang warlords in it. And they keep passing them and turning around and passing them the other direction eventually you see this little girl and her father and it feels like these two events that just keep getting closer and closer to each other eventually to the point where it's almost shocking that this was able to make through the MPAA and it certainly was a struggle if you read the history of this film to where the little girl goes to get ice cream and then the movie kicks off with the gang warlord coming out just mercilessly shooting this little girl on screen graphically I wanted vanilla twist <laughs> doing the same to the ice cream truck driver. And when the father of that little girl retaliates, they follow him, he is now the target, and he ends up in this police station trying to find sanctuary, trying to get help. And so you have the rest of Assault on Precinct 13 and the rest of this situation to where the cops inside of this precinct, as well as eventually the criminals that are inside had to band together to try to hold off this endless barrage of criminals. And there's just something so cool about that concept. Even back in the 70s, it's just such a neat setup for an action thriller. And Carpenter, this is the first film that really shows the strengths that he shows throughout the rest of his career, where he just slowly builds tension in the most simplistic ways. And he finds these concepts that have such a great hook to them, and he never really extends over that concept. He's a director and a filmmaker that has always really focused on the simplicity of what he is doing. And all of the excellence comes through his execution and the style that he injects into it. And so this is a movie that never really gets to like this huge big budget action blockbuster type thing. There's not massive explosions and huge big budget shootouts or even A-list actors that are making up the characters that this thing is focusing on. It's a very scaled down, low budget exploitation style action film. And it's through the subtleties of how John Carpenter films things with the wide angles and how he explores humanity through villains and through the heroes and all of these things that become these signature Carpenter traits 
were on full force with his first studio-backed film. And speaking of signature elements to all of his best movies, this has a really great memorable score as well that was composed by John Carpenter. And all of his best movies have that little underlying element there to where he creates the mood and he creates the tension and he creates the vibe that he's going for from his own mind by creating the score and kind of setting the bed of what you're supposed to experience during these certain sequences and throughout this film. And so you get a movie like this that could have a very action-centric score and still be very exciting and very entertaining, but he goes for this very low-key electronic tension-building score that makes the eventual siege segments and makes the ever-looming threat of this gang more omnipresent while you're watching it because it's just it's getting that emotional reaction through the music. And I really like the two leads here of Napoleon and Bishop. Bishop being like a very early first timer cop that is assigned this precinct and assigned the work of just kind of guiding it through its slow death basically where they're going to unpack this precinct and move it to the eventual new location. And then you got Napoleon who is this murderer, this criminal that we don't get a lot of details about what he has done or his history that eventually has to join up with Bishop and all the other people inside of this precinct to hold off this gang. And so I just love that dynamic where you have good guy having to work with bad guy to take out the greater evil. That's just a really cool concept that has been done really well in other movies, but even in the remake of All Assault and Precinct 13, I just like the dynamic of those two leads, whether it's Ethan Hawke and Lawrence Fishburne, or it's Austin Stoker and Darwin Johnson. I think both of those scenarios, both of those groups of leads just have a really nice dynamic with each other, and it just, it adds this extra element again to this very simplistic concept that just gives it a little more style. And the fact that they kind of, they have to confront the fact that it's a cop and a criminal working together, and they have conversations to where they kind of acknowledge that they're both on opposite ends of the law and opposite ends of the tracks. And the way that all the way through to the end of the film, they gain a bit of a mutual respect for each other to the point where uh, Bishop won't allow Napoleon to be taken out in handcuffs. He's like, I, I want the, the privilege of walking out with me. I want you to have that because you've earned it throughout this hell of a night. I just like the way that their character arcs and their stories come to that nice conclusion by the end of the film. As far as mixed aspects on Assault on Precinct 13, it's really just the ending. And a lot of that just has to do with the fact that this was a lower budget film back in the 70s. I mean, there, you can't expect big blockbuster segments out of this movie, especially with the fact that I just praised the fact that it's not a movie that hinges on those types of segments, but it's just the way that they execute this whole thing regarding the acetylene tank and these flares, and it's all off camera. You have this endless wave of enemies that are pushing back the survivors, and he gets out the sniper rifle and pops a couple of shots, and the camera stays on the protagonist in this room and just kind of shows the aftermath and the flashes of the explosion inside. You don't really get to see anything. And so it just feels a little bit anticlimactic. I like narratively where they go in the end of this film. I like the fact that it's more about their survival and their mutual understanding of each other that's kind of the climax, not so much this big, huge showdown. But at the same time, if you're going to suggest a really cool type of ending just on an action sense, I kind of like to see that stuff. I don't like it to just be suggested. As far as the negatives, I wish I liked the two female characters in this movie more, but to me, they both had the same yet opposite problem. So you have Nancy Loomis in here, which everybody loves from Halloween, and she's playing more of the uh, damsel in distress character as far as these group of people inside of this precinct. She's somebody that gets very afraid of this situation very quickly and isn't really a whole lot of help, and she's just somebody that's gonna be hysterical and frantic and you're gonna have to do all of the work for her and save her and I get that there's gonna be human beings that are gonna have that response there's gonna be characters like this in a situation but to me for what that character required she so overacts I really think they're gone I mean take a look well don't give me that civilized look and Again, not to pick on her, she wasn't the best actress in Halloween either. I haven't seen a whole lot that she's done after that, so maybe she got a little bit better. But as far as this movie, what is required of her character, it seems like she goes for the 10 and 11 when she should have been down around 5 or 6. Like, every single response that she has is just so emotional and so over the top that 
it was kind of a blessing for the movie that her character is killed very early on because she probably would have taken this down at least a point for me if I had to hear that the entire film. And then you have Laura Zimmer who's playing Lee who is the very much opposite, the antithesis of the Nancy Loomis character to where she is the tough girl. She is the uh, the Hawks girl. She is the one who is trying to be kind of the strong one and she's trying to put out this bravado and she's trying to kind of go against the female stereotypes and you're getting shot and not even and fucking reacting to it, but there's cool elements to that that I like, and it's something that's very different and was certainly welcome after the few scenes we got with Nancy Loomis, but where I feel that Nancy Loomis was overacting for her role, I feel like Lori Zimmer was underacting for her role. Like, her total unemotional dismissal of everything that's going on in this movie was too much. I like the tough girl stuff. I like her being against typecast. I like having somebody that is a bit of an unexpected personality in this situation, but after a while, it felt very odd and it felt very unnatural how calm and unemotional she was, the worse this situation was getting. I mean, like I said, she gets shot in the arm, doesn't even flinch, and doesn't stares a dude with a gun right in the eyes, doesn't do anything, doesn't freak out, doesn't react. The more that the tension boils over, the more danger that she is inevitably getting in throughout the film as it closes in on its third act, it just never really feels like she's that afraid. She's like, fuck it, if I live, I live, if I die, I die. And so it just, it was two opposite problems that kind of created the same disconnect for me. And finally, while I appreciate the Night of the Living Dead aspect that he was going for with this gang, with these kind of nameless, faceless villains that are scarier for their numbers and their unrelenting pursuit than they are for the personalities that they're given, I did miss the fact that they're was some kind of a personality or a main villain character or, or at least some kind of a character development regarding these villains. And maybe that's because I saw the remake first. Maybe it's because I saw Gabriel Byrne be this very fleshed out villain with a story, with a motivation, with this moral ground that we want to see him get his comeuppance. Maybe that set the wrong expectation. Maybe that kind of is something that I wouldn't mind very much if I watched this version first, but when I watch this film and it's just about the number of the gangs and there's this initial setup of this white gang lord that is killed off very quickly when he seems like he's gonna be the one that's the leader, that's the patriarch of this whole villainous side of things, and then you never really get any other actual characters, it's just a bunch of extras with guns, there was something about that that I just felt like there was a missed opportunity there. I understand what he was going for. I understand the, the, the realism of just having a bunch of nameless, faceless people because it's from the perspective of the people inside of the precinct. And it's not like they're going to get to know anybody before they fucking shoot them. I get that. But I guess I'm just more of a fan of character arcs. I'm more of a fan of story and character exploration than I am of something that's a little bit more realistic like that. And going along those same lines, I do feel like the movie overdid it slightly. This is absolutely a nitpick. I will wholeheartedly admit that. They overdid it slightly with showing the number of gang members that were there. I mean, there's like this establishing sequence where they show people running through the bushes and running behind cars and running around the building and coming through windows to where you could pretty much deduce that there's like between 50 to 100 of these gangsters around this building at any given time. And so it makes it a little bit unrealistic and makes it slide a little bit more into that B-movie territory on the fact that they're not a bigger threat than they actually seem to be, despite the numbers. You've got like five people in this precinct. There's a whole sequence where one person comes through a window and through a door and they're just getting popped one by one and even through the hallways. And I'm just sitting there wondering if there's that many of you guys and you're that worried about getting into this building and that's just what you're gonna do. Live or die, we're fucking these people up. Why is everybody not storming the building at once? It's one of those movie questions, I understand if you answer it with any kind of logic, the movie would be 15 minutes long, but it is something that because they took the time to show how massive the numbers of these gang members are, it made it a little bit less realistic for me in a way that I didn't appreciate. But all in all, guys, I really did enjoy this movie. Uh, I think that it is pretty close on par with the remake, and I'm just admittedly a big fan of that movie, but I like the old school exploitation version of this. I like how relentless and how cynical the, the worldview is in this to where just the little girl is just shot in the beginning. It's like, oh, that's the movie we're in for. Uh, just could have done a little bit more on the villain front for me. I think if they had a little bit more on the character side of that, I might even say that I like this more than the remake. But 
Highly enjoyed it. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed this, please click over here for the rest of my John Carpenter reviews that I've already completed. And I'm also going to put up here my top 50 action films of all time. Thank you for watching. As always, like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the rest of this review series. And remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.